As he mentioned, I'm from Thoracon, US, slanted towards building the reactors as quickly as possible. So we try to keep it very simple, not a breeder, just a burner. We have got a full power plant designed in 3D CAD, piping sizes, piping runs for the large pipes, still have to do some little ones, uh, enough that we're now going to the uh, shipyards to get a quote for how much does it cost to build this thing. Our focus is on developing nations. That's where the huge demand is in the near term. The most dangerous energy is none at all. If you don't have enough energy to pump groundwater or to run filters and you have to drink polluted surface water, that's the most dangerous thing of all. Next would be using uh, wood and dung as your heat source inside your home. And a lot of the world population does that. If you upgrade from that to using coal, that is a major upgrade in life. But my goal would be to get nuclear to be cheaper than coal so that as these places want to decide whether they're going to put in a new power plant, whether it's going to be coal or nuclear, the obvious answer is let's go with the nuclear. The developing countries can bypass some of the steps that we went through. It's a good thing for all of us because there's a lot more of them than there were of us when we went through that stage. One of our design requirements is that safety does not depend on humans. It has to be completely passive safe, even if the humans do exactly the wrong thing. We have to presume that the operators are not as skilled as the ex-nuclear Navy guys that the US tends to have. And your reputation will hang on the worst run plant. Our team is from various industries, including oil tankers, shipbuilding, uh, software, director of engineering from Google. I'm from a semiconductor background. Um, Notably, we have relatively less worth of nuclear pe people from the nuclear industry. In our industries, if you're not moving with a new product every six to 12 months, you're dying. In nuclear, we see new products are two decades, three decades. It takes a long, long time. We think if you're going to survive, if you're going to compete, because nuclear is not the only source of electricity, we have to have it where at least the vast majority of the plant can re evolve rapidly. So we work very hard to keep the nuclear regulatory portion as small as possible. So whereas we use a lot of software, we're very comfortable with software, we try to keep it completely out of the regulato regulatory domain, and no matter how bad a mistake the software makes, it doesn't endanger safety. Safety also is not really a matter of radiation. Safety is a matter of addressing fear of radiation. It's getting confidence both in the politicians, the press, and the public that you're not going to wipe them out. Because if you look at the accidents, even Chernobyl, the real harm didn't come from the radiation. As bad as Chernobyl was and as many people as it killed from radiation, that wasn't the real harm. The real harm was the, the resulting fear and panic that happened. In Fukushima, it's even more extreme where basically had no one hurt from radiation, but you've got 1,500 people or so that were killed directly from the evacuations, and probably quite a bit more that are going to end up dying early because they turned off all the nuclear power plants and switched them. The mundane particulate pollution is so bad that it's killing literally millions of people a year. And that's not something you speculate on your computer models for what's going to happen in 100 or 200 years. That's something that happens today to the extent that the Chinese leadership, political leadership, is afraid of what the population is going to do. And it's a power threat to them. And they have to change out of coal because it is dangerous to them. They have trouble with uh, getting foreign company executives to move to Beijing because the executives get there and they see the air and they say, I'm not bringing my kids here. And even in California, we feel it from China. About a third of our air pollution in California comes from China. So even if you don't believe in, in climate change, I don't want to get in debate whether you do or don't, take what motivates you. There is lots of motivation there for everybody to say, let's not build 10 times as much coal plants. We view that as a developer, we have a responsibility to address fear of radiation. In our case, that means we are going to recreate the Fukushima accident full scale with real fission products and do it in front of the politicians and say, see, nothing interesting happens. You stay here for a week and you'll see nothing interesting happens. 
please never evacuate people because of one of our plants. If you have a huge disaster, focus on helping the people from the tsunami. Our plant will take care of itself. Mainstream environmentalism, how can they be persuaded? They don't need to be. That's not a goal. Our goal is let's hit the developing world. And frankly, the developing world doesn't pay a lot of attention to Greenpeace. India just had basically ejected them because they just are in the way. Yeah, they're very important organizations in the US and in Europe, but they're not very important in the developing world, and that's where my focus is. The other thing I think is very important is that we have to approach this in a way that is scalable. That the demands, if you look at the electricity growth rates, they're going to be around 100 gigawatts of new electricity generating, not capacity, but actual generation, additional generation every year, going on for the next probably 100 years. We, seen, we saw China ramp up in 15 years to put in more electricity generation than the whole of the US. And there's a lot of other countries besides China, and China still has a long way to go. So we need a, an industry that can scale up very, very rapidly. What you see on the screen here is two Thorcon Isles. This is one Thorcon Isle. That's about 65 meters by 175 meters by 33 meters, to give you a size. And that's a 500 megawatt power plant, fully built at the shipyard from the cooling water pumps through the transformers to take the electricity off. Set up where it's shore side, so we're able to connect directly with uh, transmission lines in the air. You can also do transmission lines subsea. So there's two of them there to, to provide you a one gigawatt power plant. It is a molten salt reactor um, with the traditional pot, pump, and heat exchanger. Uh, going around in a circle. We put those inside of a can as a secondary containment, but for regulatory purposes, the can is the primary containment. So we don't claim the primary loop as a containment for regulatory purposes. That is because we're pressing uh, stainless steel uh, up into temperature regions where the codes are not well developed. If we discount this, we still have a safety case because if, even if this fails, it'll drain. And that leads us with a stainless steel container that is not under pressure. It's at 300 degrees C. It's in a helium atmosphere. It's going to be very, very reliable. Right down here, you can see a little gray thing. That's the, the freeze valve. If things overheat, it will automatically, by natural processes, open and drain. No electricity, no operators. Uh, it's basically done because we have thermal couples that are in any high, hot spots that will cut off the electricity to the helium that's keeping that freeze valve closed. Because the freeze valve will only stay closed as long as there's cold helium being pumped onto it. When the salt drains, it'll, it'll go down into these 32 tanks. Notice they're tall, skinny tanks with no moderator. So you know if the fuel has ever moved, if it ever melts, and drains, it's going to go into a place where there is no discussion about possibility of recriticality. It is not going to be critical. That is a known fact. It will simply radiate heat out to this outer wall here, which is steel and then water and then steel. So that will radiate heat like you put your hand close to but don't touch a fireplace. You can feel the heat. That will pull enough heat out to absorb all the decay heat and that will boil some water and that will make our, our pump natural circulation. So here's a zoom in on the freeze valve. What it basically is, is a section of pipe that's been crimped, and then there's cold helium forced on it that will freeze the salt at that section. It's only uh, about five centimeters long, just a small plug of salt that's frozen. And then there are reservoirs of hot salt on either side that are kept heated. So if you lose electricity, there's enough thermal capacity in the hot salt to melt that little plug and drain it. So it is a fail-safe operation. This is literally a copy of what is done for MSRE, and we have four times the salt, so we put in four of them. This is a temperature profile. We did a CFD simulation of the uh, drain tanks, um, and in a worst-case scenario, we're looking at around 900 degrees C at the top of the salt level inside the drain tanks, um, which is acceptable for stainless steel for many hours, for a day or two. Even in a worst case condition, we would drain into the drain tank and have uh, cooling from there. 
By the time you're about two hours into that worst case condition, things have started to cool down, where we're pulling more heat out than the decay heat is putting in. And in that case, we've consumed about half a percent of the creep lifetime of the drain tanks. So whenever you take steel and you overheat it, it will stretch a little bit. And if you keep stretching it, eventually it'll, it'll give. So we have a lifetime limit on that, and we've used about half a percent. So we've not used up very much of its life. We have built a system simulation in Python of our full power plant, a model of the core, which is actually a finer grain model than what was used in MSRE, but is philosophically the same thing. So uh, Sid may be interested in that. And then we include the, the various heat exchangers. Uh, we do have tertiary loop here, which is a little unusual. We have that because we don't want to get steam mixed with any kind of fluoride salt. Because if you mix steam with the fluoride salt, you'll get hydrogen fluoride, which is not a pleasant chemical to have around. This third salt loop here uses something called solar salt. It's used in solar thermal power plants. Nitrate salt has a lot of oxygen in it. You can actually get quite a lot of moisture into that salt and it's still very happy. We avoid getting any kind of nasty chemical reaction between those. We've used this to, to study a number of different transients. In this case, what we did is to ramp down the salt flow at 10% per minute till it was half flow and then ramped it back up. This would be your primary means of uh, changing power levels. This is at 10% per minute, which is double the rate that the EU utility requires, which is 5% per minute. So it's a, at a decent ramp rate and done only with changing the flow rate of the pumps. That is a, a little more aggressive than what MSRE had. We'll see if we can actually pull that off um, or if we actually have to use a regulating rod to make the transitions. The goal is between the four loops to keep the steam temperature within plus and minus 15 degrees C. You don't want to jerk the high pressure, thick steel components that are in the, in the turbine around in temperature very fast because the blades will expand much faster than the casing and then they'll rub and that's not good. We did run a case that was like Fukushima. Well, suppose there's an earthquake and we drop the shutdown rods and then for 45 minutes, well, actually we did it for less time, but for a while you have the pump still running because the diesels were still running for 45 minutes. That drops the salt temperature down and then the system drains and the maximum temperature seen in the primary loop then is 750, which is just modestly over its normal operating range. Our baseline design assumes high assay, low enriched uranium, awful name, 19.75% enriched and then uh, the rest of it's thorium. So it, the heavy metal is 85% thorium and 15% uranium. Uh, this is to satisfy the proliferation concerns while at the same time getting as much as we can from the thorium. That has good implications for the fuel costs. It's about half a cent per kilowatt for fuel. We generate about half of our own fuel. Between the thorium and the uranium-238, we end up generating about half of the fuel we use. It means that we generate about 47 kilograms of plutonium per gigawatt year, which is about one-sixth of a, what a light water reactor generates. We can, once everybody agrees, put the plutonium back in the reactor. Uh, but our anticipation is that that kind of agreement is going to take maybe decades. It's a purely political question. There's no good reason to wait that long. We can just store it until people come to an agreement. The challenge is that the developing world is installing electricity at a fierce rate. Once they install a coal power plant, you're not going to convince them to turn it off and replace it with your nuclear power plant. Every year we lose getting going is that many more coal plants that are up and probably will be up for 50 years. So we want to postpone dealing with separating plutonium and trying to recycle that for another day. It can sit in the spent fuel for decades, no harm done. We do have a backup plan because we are not confident that the low enriched uranium, high assay low enriched uranium is going to be available when we are ready for it. So we also can run on straight 5% enriched uranium. Uh, that probably would skip the thorium portion of it. Uh, economics still work out okay. The waste flow is higher. Plutonium generation is higher. Um, but it works and it's good enough to get rolling until the uh, high assay LEU is up 
available in quantity. Uh, we have a chicken and egg problem there in that the people who build enrichment plants say, Urenco says, we, we've already developed the plans. We know what we need to do. It'll take us four years to do it. But we have to be convinced there's a market there first. So we have to have a roadmap that says, we can build it and start uh, building out plants and then show them that we have the uh, market so that they can get going and building the enrichment plant. We also can consume existing plutonium. So for some areas, the UK, for example, the US, uh, Japan, have separated plutonium that they really don't have a good plan for what to do with. We'd love to help them with that. So our plan is we're going to build a complete factory in the shipyard. Here you see the can inside of the silo. And that water that I said boils uh, in decay heat removal will end up going up to a radiator that's in the bottom of this pond. That pond will then evaporate water out. That pond has enough water to last for six months. And at that point, there's enough cooling from air cooling to last forever. If you compare that to an AP1000, we have about 10 times as much water per megawatt thermal as an AP1000 does for the decay heat removal. So we think we have a very legitimate claim to say, take care of your tsunami victims. We'll be OK. Almost always, when you try to build a nuclear power plant, you have to make a political deal with the local government that you're going to hire a lot of local people who have never built a nuclear power plant before. And oh, by the way, if they get a uh, reinforcement rod off by an inch, you've got to rip it out and do it over. Is it any surprise that build times take 10, 15 years to build these things? We're telling the people that, no, we're not going to build it with local labor. We're going to build it in a factory. In our case, the factory is a shipyard that already knows how to do this, and they've been doing it for 30 years. This ship is built exactly like oil tankers. Our founder designed the four largest oil tankers in the world. They are each about twice the size of one of our power plants. So we know exactly what we need to do. We've designed it to fit into the shipyards. They can churn these out. In fact, just the surplus in shipbuilding capacity in the world today is enough to churn out 100 gigawatts of new power plants every year. So we, we have the capacity. We can build these out. It takes about one year to build such a thing. Uh, and they will sign a firm fixed price, firm schedule, with heavy penalties if they're late, contract to do it. Try to get your uh, AP1000 builder to sign such a contract. We are modular when we're building it. Um, but we build the whole thing, and then we take it to the site. We use the ocean as our transport, as our freeways. We don't try to transport it on a road or a rail, because we want to have as big a module as we can, in our case, a full power plant. That does restrict us to being deployed close to the ocean or up major rivers, but that gets you within 500 miles of almost all the population in the world. And a 500-mile transmission line is not a great big heartburn. We can build it inland, but that's more pain. Uh, and so it will take a little longer to get to those versions. This is a finite element model. So we built a finite element model of the entire uh, plant and have tested it against uh, the North Sea. So we have a 100-year storm with 9-meter waves. If you could imagine your power plant being lifted and, and moved up and down by nine meters on one side and then the other and rocked back and forth like that, that gives us accelerations uh, in excess of 1G that lasts for hours or days, not one or two minutes. So to us, that's a lot more severe a test than earthquakes. We've already passed that test. Uh, we're now working on the aircraft strike. Uh, the exterior walls have three meters space, steel, three meters, and then steel. This is standard for double hull carriers. If you fill that space with concrete, it will take any aircraft strike you, you want. We are struggling a little bit with the modeling of that. The LS Dyna models have deformable targets, but rigid strikers, or deformable strikers are rigid targets. And we really need to have deformable for both. So we've taken the very conservative approach of saying, when the plane strikes the power plant, the plane stays in perfect condition, and the power plant gets damaged. If you've seen the F-4 fighter running into the concrete wall, 
That's not what happens. <laughs> Uh, the plane turns to dust and the concrete wall gets a dent. So when we make that very conservative assumption, the GE engine, which is the largest engine around, penetrates by a tenth of a meter, 0.15 meters, and then bounces back. Also have done that with sand. Sand makes it a little easier for us to deconstruct the power plant. So the plan for deconstructing it is the reverse of installing it. So when we install it, we, we tow it to the site, then we ballast it so it sits on the sea bottom, so it's sitting firmly on the sea bottom. When we want to uh, decommission the power plant site, we take out the can, and that's the whole radioactive portion. And then for the rest of it, you deballast it, and you can tow it back to a standard ship junkyard site where they, they recover it for steel. For earthquakes, we're not expecting any problem for safe shutdown. The spec at the moment is 0.8 Gs, um, which is in fair contrast to uh, what the standard uh, light water reactor specs are, which are 0 0.3, 0 0.4 Gs. So that should allow us to deploy to a lot more sites. We're not providing a spec for the operating basis at earth earthquake yet, because that will depend on what happens with the turbines. And to be honest, we're competing with coal. We don't see other nuclear as our primary competition. We see our primary competition in the developing world is coal. They don't have a spec on their operating basis equipment earthquake, so we're not trying to spec one either. We're really focused on trying to keep the cost down. We believe we're going to come in at under a dollar a watt um, and at cost of around three cents per kilowatt hour and a price around six cents per kilowatt hour. I think the biggest impact is going to be the companies have a reliable electricity close to their park. So I'm envisioning that you're going to end up with large industrial parks pretty close to these nuclear power plants that provide employment, and that's the biggest benefit to people. Our first country deployment is planned to be Indonesia. We're working with the regulator to establish how they're going to do pre-licensing hearings. This is something that they had not planned on doing. They have three operating test reactors, but no power plant reactors, which gives us a regulator that has experience with nuclear, but isn't wedded to light water reactors. But they had always envisioned that they were going to buy somebody else's reactor and import it. So we're having to, to go through, change some regulations, change some laws to allow them to have an indigenous reactor, one that is first licensed and first tested in their country. Actually, on this business trip, I coming back from Indonesia, where we signed a memorandum of understanding where the Ministry of Energy has requested a specific study to verify our claims as far as cost buildability as well as to choose between one of three sites where they'd like to put the first one. So they asked me to keep it really short. I think I did. Uh, and to give you time for questions. The primary vessel, will that be uh, Hastulay N? No. It'll be stainless steel 316. That is much more readily available and much more readily skill sets available to how, to how to deal with it. Our can has to last for four years and then it gets replaced because the graphite has to be replaced. We'll measure it and see. Uh, everything we've seen says if we add it one millimeter thicker, it'll last 40 years. What is the exit temperature of your nitrate salt in this tertiary cycle? 570 right now because that is the temperature of that's used in solar salt thermal plants. So that's Fahrenheit? Uh, no, that's Celsius. Do you observe any phase transition of uh, fluids? No, the salt is solid at 500. We start at 565. It boils at 430. We stop at 704. So no, we don't see that. You said that uh, we work with uh, NEU or even 5% and you mentioned the plutonium accumulation. How do you deal with proliferation? Because if you stay with your plutonium in there. It's similar to light water reactors. You have a spent fuel that has to be monitored. It's still in the fission products until it gets separated. The process of separating it is very much wrapped up in prol proliferation questions. So. We postpone that until the politics get worked out. So I like the presentation you gave on your uh, power plant, and you mentioned that you have to change the can from time to time. If I recall your website, you have a special ship for that. Yes. Do you have any specifications for that ship? Yes, we've drawn up some specifications for it. There are international standards for ships that do 
transport nuclear materials, um, and they don't seem to be daunting. Yeah, who is going to pay for the techno-economics? Is the Indonesian government going to do that, or uh, somebody else? No, we get to. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> but the way we're doing it is we're going to one of the major shipyards and providing them a list of suppliers and contacts, and so they're providing a cost estimate. So it's not us that's estimating, it's, it's people who are in the business. What is the composition of your salt in the primary loop and secondary loop? So the primary loop salt is sodium fluoride, beryllium fluoride. Fly but separate, but replace the lithium-7 with sodium. Not as good neutronically, but it's something I can buy. Secondary salt loop is the same, but doesn't have any heavy metals in it. Okay, thank you. Are you planning any uh, online processing, or are you just assuming you'll do processing batch at the end? No, we're not planning on online processing other than helping the off-gas to come out. we get some plate out of noble metals. And no, we're not planning on doing much reprocessing at the end either because that gets us all wrapped up in NNSA and proliferation discussions. So for the time being, it'll be spent fuel canisters. But I should point out that Indonesia has, I think, 17,000 islands, of which 13,000 are uninhabited. And we'll take one of those to be the national repository for the lifetime of all the power that's generated in, in Indonesia. I mean, you got to remember, we're talking Coke cans here, not tra train loads. So it does, really doesn't take much space. One more question, then we're going to have to move on. Okay. Pick one. You get to pick. Go on, pick the young guy. Let's pick the young guy. <laughs> Do you have an ID of the dose rate coming up of the can after the four, four years cycle? The fuel is transferred from the can from that, that it was used in the operating into a shipping cask, which is more robust and has shielding. If you're outside of that shipping cask, you can hug it and not get overdosed. It's just like, you know, you can, you can hug a dry cask cylinder as well uh, and not get too much dose. Let's thank Lars again. Is there any uh, sort of message you would give to, say, young people who are interested in clean energies that are not as obvious how they work as a wind turbine spinning around? If what you're concerned about is CO2, then let's talk about ways to reduce CO2. If it reduces the CO2, great, then let's look into that. I'd also say people of my generation have been more indoctrinated against nuclear, uh, and younger people seem to be more open to looking into it. Mm -hmm. So I strongly encourage them to actually look at the data, look at how many people have been killed by all the different power sources, and understand you may have been fed a lot of propaganda. There seems to have grown a pessimism about the future. Mm -hmm. Disaster is coming. Blow that off. we got a great future coming. Mm -hmm. And go out and do something really interesting.